Hello. How many people think serverless is the future? Raise your hand. Yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> the reason why I doubt it is because we can use it right now. It's not very futuristic. You can go almost anywhere and get a serverless offering. I don't think it's very futuristic. Um, I think it does add a new tool to the mix, but I think what's actually hurting the adoption is the overpromising, right? Uh, most people that have to approach this from a very pragmatic viewpoint, it doesn't really solve general computing needs. It is a computing platform, but it doesn't necessarily solve general computing needs, in my opinion. So I come from, I'm an old school sysadmin, probably started with Solaris and Linux, and then there's mainframe. There's all these computing platforms, each promising to do better than the previous computing platform. How many people work in the enterprise? Right? If you go there, you see all of the platforms still in use. No matter which new one pops up, we just add it to the mix. It doesn't replace everything else. Right? And there's a reason for that. Right? These tools, they come out at these various checkpoints. So for me, I'm going to be talking about serverless as a skeptic. Okay? So at Google today, I work on um, cloud functions in many capacities. Uh, my area of expertise is Kubernetes, so I'm a bit biased towards the container world but there are things I like in the function world. So to start, we have to think about, most people think about this function thing as like this brand new thing that's going to change the world. And it's pretty silly that we think executing a snippet of code will change the world. <laughs> Maybe the things you build may, but not executing a snippet of code. So when, I ask, when people say, Kelsey, what is serverless? And there's a bunch of things like managed services are very attractive to me, this idea that there's a collection of services I could just use. Four years ago, people would say that's all lock-in. If I told you I had a collection of services that you just use and pay me as you go, you would scream lock-in. Now today, people see that as value and I think that is progress, right? I think there is some value in having people provide a service. But we're th let's talk about the compute layer for a second. So when I saw serverless for the first time, uh, people give the platform a snippet of code and then it responds to some event. And people's like, you gotta see this new thing. And I said, wow, okay, that's, that's interesting. Let me show you something. So I'm an old school Linux admin. How many people know what XINETD is? So this is the main problem to me with technology. Most people do not look at what comes before. Sometimes you can actually learn from previous implementations to see where they fall short and usually there's fundamental aspects that can't be resolved. This is John Van Neumann's Intel architecture still. It's not like we have a whole new computing paradigm. There are limits to the way we deal with these machines. So I'm gonna show you XINETD. How many people ever wrote a C daemon before? Something that runs a long time. And C. All right, now, I want you to answer really, really quickly, no playing games. How many file descriptors do you need to close when you start your C process? Say it, quick. Quick, how many? Three is absolutely wrong, right? Everyone thinks about standard in, standard error, and standard out, but there's so many more file descriptors that if you don't detach from your parent, you're going to cause all kind of problems. And this is why most people have bugs when they write C. So there was a solution to this. It's hard. So we had these super daemon, okay? This is the 70s, folks. There's this super daemon. So you have this machine that has, I don't know, couple hundred megs of RAM, you can't run all your processes at the same time. It's a constrained environment. And most people don't know how to write a proper daemon. So we have a super daemon. And what the super daemon does is says, hey, if you write a little bit of code, I'm gonna show you. If you write a little bit of code and you give me a configuration, let's just do it hello world. Why don't you look at this? All right, this all it says, it says, hey, if a packet shows up on port 8080, we're going to invoke your business logic, 1970. And then when you're done, it will exit the process, okay, 70s. And you know what was using this? FTP, SSH, you couldn't just run those forever on a server, you would run out of memory. So in these resource constraints environment, we try to give people a much easier paradigm. And then we also try to give it a contract. Anyone know what the contract to that binary is? 
I'm going to show you the code. Instead of thinking about all the startup code and closing file descriptors, you get input on standard in, you write the standard out, and it would do everything. Okay? So if a client wants to invoke this service, all I have to do is build this binary, put it in a path, I'm going to show you. It's 1970. Netcat. We'll give it the IP, and then we'll say 8080. That's it. And it goes away. Right? Invoke real time. So think about that. One request, one response. It actually scaled really well for the situation, right? Most people had a server that needed to do multiple things. So in the context of a single machine, it was fine. It did what it was supposed to do, right? The kernel did everything else in terms of context switching. This did a better job of saying, hey, instead of you running all your daemons, it would load them on demand and then shut them down, right? And you could actually, actually have something actually long running, and it will actually create a stream to it if you wanted to have some more performance. So they added features over time, okay? But for the context, it was the right tool for the job. We didn't have thousands and thousands of servers back then. One server, you could do this, you were fine. There's a lot more to learn from this, this paradigm. So this is the world I'm coming from. It's not a net new situation. It's just that that paradigm is pretty nice when you want to have some convenience and you're dealing with resource constraints. So what I'm going to do now is going to talk about uh, what it's like to build an app from scratch, in my opinion, just the way I observe the platform. How many people have built a full end-to-end -end serverless application? Not a lot of hands. Ooh, it's interesting to know why you can't do it. It's supposed to be super easy. Everyone says, oh, dude, you just write a little snippet, get some events, you're done. And then you go try it, and you're like, ah, not true. Some things don't work. This is that impedance mismatch. If we keep over-promising, then I think people will be turned off on the platform and retreat. So the first thing I do is try to build something end-to-end. -end. So I, I ported this weather service from Kubernetes and containers and say, you know, if I'm going to really learn this platform, so I also contribute it to our backend internally. But as a front-end user, what does it actually feel like? And I made some mistakes along the way. So why are we even doing this stuff? I think it kind of starts with the data. So we do it all for data, right? This is kind of the fundamental element. The reason why we're doing all of this compute, or what we should, is that we want to do something with our data for our customers, for our users. So most people say, if you're going to go in the serverless world, you should focus on the business problem. And we believe that we don't have to focus on infrastructure at all. And you'll see this, that I don't know if that's 100% true. And we'll see that there's different types of infrastructure you think about. So what I want to do is I'm just going to build a very simple weather service. I have a list of locations. And I need to turn those things into coordinates. So what I have to do here is, and I remember, you want to think about this as a developer step by step. I need to take those locations, and I need to get the weather coordinates for them. Now, if I was thinking about this maybe in a traditional con uh, context, maybe I'd go find some open source thing that had geo data, and I would install it, and I would run it myself. In this case, we want to use a managed service. Now, this is from talking to people that do this. They are very comfortable finding a managed service for as much as they can and using those APIs to get the task done that they need. Now, I'm a little skeptical about this, because what happens when these services go away? What do you do? We don't know yet. It hasn't been that long. So in this case, I'm going to use a managed service. I'm going to use the Google Maps API. So this is what the game is about. So I find this Maps API. I can actually afford it. All right? I can you know, ping some locations. It gives me back geo coordinates. And ideally, what I want to do is take those geo-coordinates and store them in some database, OK? Um, I'll delete this data. Man, my demo better work. <laughs> Don't be deleting your data live. Uh, sorry, <laughs> good idea. And it's also interesting about what we think about the data layer. So we have things like object store. We have all these databases. But again, we're setting ourselves up in a way where we're saying we, we don't ever want to manage anything. So that kind of limits our choices a little bit in terms of what we can do. Most cloud providers have a managed database. There's also third parties that have a managed database. In this case, I'm using Cloud Data Store mainly because I just don't want to spin up a SQL server or deal with the authentication process. All right, so the first thing we have to do here is make a function that actually uh, takes in this weather data, 
gets these coordinates and get the temperature. Where are we going to get the temperature from? Well, from another service. This is the weather service. If I give it geo coordinates, it will give me back the current temperature. All right, so another managed service. I'm going to pull it in and I'm going to store it in a database. Now, here's the problem. The National Weather Service doesn't know anything about events, right? Typically, when you see these functions as a service platform, they assume you have an event, and that event will trigger your business logic. But what happens when you don't have an event? What do you do? Someone give me an answer. You do what? Ah, oh, you can't poll. No polling. Remember, this is the thing that's paid for use. If you poll, that would be pragmatic, right? Can't do that. You do what? A what? A normal error. Error. Yeah. But there's nothing to even trigger our function. So there's no error to be produced. There's nothing happening. So we have to manufacture an event. This service knows nothing about my event or my function. It doesn't know how to trigger it. It doesn't emit events. So we have to glue together the actual real world that exists today. So I do like this paradigm that my function only gets called when there's an event, but we have no event. So I need an event. So what we need to do now is we'll deploy our function. I have a few of them here, and I'll show them to you. So I have this thing called the weather data collector, and it listens for events on this weather events pub sub queue. But the outside world doesn't have an event, so I have to make one up. So the way we can make up events is we can actually compose our own events. So I'm gonna go here, weather data collector, and if you look at what I'm doing here, I have a payload here for each of those cities. And it's very simple. It just has location and then location. And then what I'm going to do now is create a timer event that will execute every five minutes or so and tell my function, hey, go and process this location and do all the things necessary to get the temperature. Okay? So this is where I'm gluing the real world or the cur current world so that I can actually manufacture this particular event. Right? And this is a solution that I see customers do all the time when there's actually uh, a need to actually do this. All right, so we're just going to create this. So I'm gonna show you this little script that I'm going to run that's going to actually publish these events. Here, so I'm just gonna create these scheduled jobs. Autocomplete, there we go. All right, so now I'm going to just inject an event for each of these, so I have a timer. And that timer is going to emit that data every five minutes, okay? Now, hopefully in the future, most services will have some event that can then fire to complete this ecosystem. Until then, you're going to have to do these kind of stopgap solutions. All right, so now that I have this timer, I'm going to hit refresh here. And I'm just going to invoke them really quickly. Quick, quick. All right. And we'll go here. Now, what should happen is, I think this is up-to-date data. What's the temperature in New York right now? That's about right, give or take five degrees. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have some data now being populated by, by this particular function. Now, here's the thing. What the hell is happening? How do you troubleshoot this thing? What's that? Logs. Not so much. I don't want to look at logs. I don't know what the hell the logs are doing. And I actually don't know how long it took to talk to all these services. Quick guess, how many services did I talk to in order to get this weather data? How many calls did I make? Two. Someone said two? You said at least three. You notice all this guessing? Yeah. This is like IT in real life. You just guess enough until it becomes true, and then when someone guesses right, it's like, oh, he just knows. He's a really smart guy. <laughs> you should get him in the war room when there's a problem. He seems to have all the answers. I pretty much think he's guessing. <laughs> he is guessing. So one thing that kind of helps with this problem is the distributed trace. I think in this kind of black box environment, you need some tracing. Logs to me won't cut it, especially if you have things executing all over the place. It's going to be too hard for you to correlate that by yourself. So I think the distributed traces, so here's the weather trace for this weather service. Look at all the things that it's going through. Look at that. So the first thing is I'm going to Google Cloud Storage so I can actually pull my API key. Okay? So my API key to talk to Maps is there. 
So this is a particular service that doesn't use Google's IEM credentials, so it isn't as rosy. I need to actually go pull API key. So there's a bit of infrastructure that I need to set up. I need to store it somewhere and encrypt it. And then I, make a, then I actually make a request to the Maps API, then the Find Places API, then the Details API, then the Weather Service. And you notice the Weather Service is taking pretty long here. It's like half a second just to get that response. Then I go to my data store, and then I can also trace within the database. Okay? If you build enough of these functions, you're going to need this level of visibility. You cannot try to do this guessing thing. I know some of you are going to continue to guess and try, but trust me, it's going to be painful as hell if people have to figure out what the hell your function is doing. The, the dev loop for this and just putting print statements is a little bit different than developing on your local machine or in, in something like Docker. So this level of visibility to me was not necessary. Now, let's look at the code behind this. Most people think of functions as these short snippets, right? That's what you think, right? This boilerplate is all gone. How many people believe the boilerplate goes away? You can raise your hand, like be, be honest, right? Like, so I was like, yes, functions are going to make my life so much better. But to get this level of detail, you cannot do this from the outside. People believe that the cloud provider can just do this 100% from the outside. Not really especially if you want to annotate this data. Some of this stuff I'm actually annotating with specific details about the actual geolocations that are coming back. Maybe I can't find it here. I'm actually giving a lot of context and linking to the actual logs that are being produced uh, by these functions, right? So for example, I can link back to the actual structured log to tell me a little bit more detail. In order to do this, you have to do some work inside of your code. So let's look inside of the code really quickly. You ready? Look at the boilerplate. You still import your logging libraries. You still import your tracing libraries. You still need to connect to the damn database. I don't know why people thought that was going to be magic. You still need the drivers. So from my experience, what happens with this function signature, even though we think it's just going to be this simple function signature, it becomes the substitute for your main entry point, right? So if you're writing a Go program, you have function main. Most people think that's boilerplate. But all you did was kind of trade it for your function to be the main entry point. And then what do your functions actually look like? And I actually tried to find some clean code examples, and I couldn't. You end up in a world where, look what I'm going to do at the entry point of this function. Look at all this setup work I'm doing. Right? You still will do this stuff somewhere, because if you think about how functions get invocated, someone has to set up the config. Someone has to set up some of the parameters. Now, some of this stuff we could probably move to a separate package, but the code and the need to do this kind of application-level infrastructure can't go away if you want to have this kind of granular, fine-grained tracing and logging. So you have to be a little bit more pragmatic about how you're actually going to do these. So I, actually, I moved some of this stuff to common libraries, but I want you to actually see what happens in a production-like function if you want to cover all the bases. This stuff just does not disappear. You still need to set up your clients. You still need to trace them if you actually want that kind of visibility. So that's what the code looks like. So this little simple function ends up being 365 lines of code, okay? Right? And then there's some other code that's coming from the cloud provider itself, but this is the kind of thing that I'm still responsible for, right? Just want to make sure people understand that this isn't just going to be 30 line code snippets all over the place. All right, so now that we have this weather data collector, let's move on. So I'm going to speed up a little bit here. So now we're going to put an API server on top of this. Now this is where I started making a few mistakes. Now the API servers, or anything that returns data in my opinion, seems to be a good fit for these function layers, right? If I invoke it, I get back some data, I store data. I'm actually deploying all of my functions with well-scoped permissions. This is one thing I do like about granularly breaking down these functions into in, uh, very specific things. So each of these run with its own IAM set of credentials. For example, only the weather data collector is allowed to write to the database. The API server is allowed to read to the database. To me, this is a net improvement even over microservices where a microservice is maybe handling all the CRUD-related activities, get, delete, and put, and post. So I end up giving it a very wide set of permissions. In this case, every one of these functions has a very scoped down set of permissions. So with this weather API, it returns data. It was a good fit. So I'm going to deploy it here. And if you look at this trigger URL, this is the first 
thing that I ran into. Do I actually want to deploy these functions and have them open to the world? Okay. So by default, we decided to make them private by default. So that way, you're not charged when you hit this particular area. Cost pay per use sounds great until you don't know how much you're using. Then you run into a different kind of panic, right? What if I get DDoS? Who eats the bill? Because you got to remember, for a long range service, this is not cheaper. This is cheaper if you can actually abide by the contract of only being used in a rate that's lower than always on 24 7. When you hit 24 7 and you have a stream of data, you're probably better off in a slightly different compute paradigm. So we don't charge people when you can't authenticate. So how do we authenticate to this thing? How do you authenticate to this? Anyone want to guess? Bear tokens. tokens? Yes, something like that. So here's the thing. In Google, we ended up using IAM, and if you have an IAM credential, you can mint a JOT token that's short-lived to invoke this function. Now here's the thing. At Google, we don't have an, an API gateway like Amazon does, but we do have another product called Apogee. So what Apogee does is, is this big API management platform. You can put it on top of any service, and it does a bunch of things. Rate limiting, I can monetize, I can do all of these things on top of my functions, which is nice, but the problem is it doesn't know how to invoke the private functions. How many people are system administrators? There's one back there. He's like, serverless people don't need system administrators. <laughs> they do. <laughs> And one other great use case I saw for the serverless paradigm was to glue things together that don't normally work together. So I'm going to show you something that I've done in Apigee to overcome this inability to invoke a private function. So this actually is a kind of a fully managed uh, remote proxy that sits on top on the edge. And the nice thing is I can teach it some new tricks. One of them is I can build a pipeline of activities that it does on request. So one of those activities would be uh, when a request comes in, I want you to get a token, update the header, and then invoke the cloud function underneath and return a response. So I'm going to show you a visualization of that pipeline. So I'm going to just click on trace. And again, in these black boxes, you need the ability to debug. So what I'm going to do is start a tracing session here. Now, once this tracing session is going, we're going to just call this API. All right, so let's go here. Uh, let's do this. W or curl, C U R L. Whew. Um, I'm trying to hit some shortcuts here. All right. And then what we're going to do is say um, location equals Portland, Oregon. I think this might be wrong, but we'll try it. You know what you do in this case? Don't be shy. You copy and paste in front of the live audience like a boss. <laughs> <laughs> There's no shame in that particular activity. All right, click, 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 click. All right, here, we'll hit paste. So you witness the cold start, and then we get data back. So what's actually happening here? So if I step through this, we can actually see um, that we have a particular background function that's actually populating a key value store that actually holds um, a uh, particular credential. And is it going to show it here? So what's doing here is I'm grabbing the token that's being minted in the background by another function. So it's actually using IAM to create a token stored in an encrypted store in Apigee. And then I actually insert that into a header, and then I call the function as necessary. So this means that we're forcing all interaction through our Apigee gateway, okay? So this is one way to kind of glue two things together that don't normally work to extend functionality. So I treat functions like an SDK for the cloud provider. Um, I have this on GitHub, and we can look at it later. So here's the next thing. I need a front end to this. Where should I host my HTML front end? Should I put it in the function? No, why not? So most people that have a problem with the cold start latency problem is that if a user were to click on your website and it takes even a second to load, everyone's going to freak out. 
And then you lose that on some of the benefits of like caching. And maybe you could put something like Apogee in front of it and cache it. So what I ended up doing is stop putting my front end all together inside of the function. And I moved it. So I actually learned some JavaScript. And uh, <laughs> the world is not the same. Um, so what I've done is I wrote a little JavaScript. I wasn't really good at it. How many people are really good at writing just like plain JavaScript, like a single page web app? See, I'm not. There's like only two people here, right? So how do you actually build these things? Um, this is where if you're a developer or a senior developer, you got to know about uh, Stack Overflow, OK? <laughs> you can ask it all these questions. And then helpful people show up, and they usually tell you exactly what to do, right? So like, this looks like what I want to do, OK? You got to be careful, though, because this is the internet. So when you think about this, you want to look for security vulnerabilities, scan it, OK, right? Um, just a good once over with the eye will do, OK? <laughs> <laughs> so the saying goes, uh, uh, good developers copy, great developers paste. <laughs> and you save that, OK? Don't worry about anything else, OK? You're fine. <laughs> it's the internet. No one's going to do any harm on the internet. And the next logical thing for you to do, honestly, is to deploy it straight to production. Right? You got to move fast with this stuff, right? Developer agility is important. So what we do is you don't need to worry about that security audience stuff. We're going to go serverless and secureless at the same time. <laughs> so we're just going to do Firebase deploy. So what I'm doing here is actually I'm just going to host my assets as a set of static files on something like Firebase. And the goal here is that I want to have the logic just communicate to my back end. So this should load fast, so the user's perception is fast, kind of like we see on the mobile device, right? Like you load the mobile app, it's local, it's fast. And the back end, we're making these asynchronous data calls. And this is why I think for the function layer, anything that returns data or stores data seems like a great fit. But the presentation layer, to me, doesn't seem like a great fit in the serverless or back end uh, paradigm. So once this is deployed, I can now go to Firebase to make sure it's there. So those are my functions showing up also in Firebase. But I can go to my static hosting. So I have a custom URL pointed to this. And as soon as I put a C name, I get this um, TLS uh, certificate. Everything is fully managed. And again, this is part of my serverless architecture. Again, I'm departing from functions in this case and using a different uh, hosting service. If I click on it, then we'll see that I get the presentation layer fast. But then we see the asynchronous call in the background. So even though we see the perceived latency there, you can imagine a page with many widgets calling asynchronously in the background. So we're hiding this. So this is a single page web app sold from, uh, uh, being stood up from static files. And now as I click through this, we'll see the asynchronous call in the background should update the page and speed things up. So we're no longer hitting that initial cold start. Things should be much faster. And again, we're serving that presentation layer um, from some edge with a nice cache in front of it. Now to wrap this thing up, uh, the next use case I see people do with this whole serverless thing, it just integrate with existing solutions, okay? So the last thing here is where people want to do something like um, add voice assistant to this. Okay, so we have this API, we have all this business logic. We can take that business logic and integrate with something else. Uh, in this case, I'm going to add the weather assistant. So I'm just going to have the Google assistant sit on top of this thing, and I'm just going to talk to it. Now, this is a good... To me, the function thing seems to be OK as well for this particular layer. I have a little bit of business logic. My front end is actually dialogue flow. So here, I make all of my voice integrations here. I design my conversation. And then I give it a back end URL that would actually process this, right? So you can ask for temperature in any of these ways. It'll be intelligent. It'll create a model based on this. And then at the end of this, I will actually give it uh, some web hook to handle my fulfillment, right? So this is going to talk to Apigee. You'll notice here that Apigee is also terminating my API key. I keep all of this stuff out of my functions. I try to keep my functions as simple as possible and have the edge services do as much as they can. So in this case, we're going to test it out and see if it works. So we're going to talk to the local weather service. Hello, California. Yes, it works. Sweet. So we'll talk back to it. Looks like you have a pretty large crowd here. Yeah. I hope you're definitely not on your side. <laughs> Me too. 
All right, so now we can ask for things. What's the weather in New York? Okay. So if this is working, ideally we'll go through Apogee, the API token key will be hit from dialog flow, and then we'll invoke our function and return the temperature. The current temperature in New York, New York, USA is 46 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so it looks like it works. And we'll tell it thanks. Okay, I gotta admit, that was pretty dope. <laughs> uh, and with that, that's, that's all I have for the presentation. So I, you can clap. When you approach this serverless thing, you need to be very, very pragmatic about what it's good at and what it's not. It isn't going to solve all your problems. It's very much the present, not the future. And I think the future is bright because there are a lot of problems to solve. So thank you. Any questions? When I said polling, I meant timers. I mean, I meant the same thing. Polling and timers aren't the same thing, right? It's like I'm dead, but I'm alive. It's like you got to pick one, right? So yeah. Like, most people think of polling as your website being up, polling some endpoint itself, right? Or at least I do. Let's, let's say I think of polling as my app is up, either watching a message queue or polling some HTTP endpoint with my developer credentials. In the function world, when you tell someone that your code is going to be basically not running at all, therefore your function itself is not allowed to poll anything. There's other machinery in front of it. So in this case, the scheduler, it's not really polling either. It's just emitting a timer event saying, hey, every five minutes, I'm going to invoke your function, and then your function wakes up, and then it goes and scrapes all the endpoints that it wants to grab data from. How do you envision like serverless compute getting too big enterprises? All right, so this is the last question I'm gonna ask, uh, answer. So the question is, how do you envision serverless compute getting into large enterprises. I used to work in financial, right, where um, we had mainframe, message queues, we had so many compute platforms, different lines of businesses doing things. The thing that seems the most obvious for me is either net new functionality, if you have an existing stack, an existing investment, you actually make money today. You have real customers today. Then the, I think a very pragmatic approach would be, if you think about like the ETL process or any pipeline, if I have this monolithic application where I am keep adding, like if I onboard a new bank into the financial sector, they have a new file format that we don't use. So now I have to have my dev team go and implement this new file processing in the monolith, right? It's causing us pain. There I can actually see this paradigm working well. We have the customer upload this particular file, and now we just implement this file parsing as a dedicated function just for that one task. We don't have to touch the monolith. We can experiment safely. I can deploy it quickly. It can do the conversion, put it in an Oracle database, if you will, and it's a very small snippet of code that adds real business value really, really quickly without touching anything else. That's less fear. I think most people can understand you bringing in just this bit of functionality over time. I don't know if you go rewrite all your applications to take advantage of this. I think you've got to be more opportunistic and look at use cases or small extensions that you can add to your stack. All right? Thank you.